The Bones and Bobbins podcast is now on Patreon. Would you like access to bonus episodes, digital extras, exclusive merch, and more? Well, join us in the Curiosity Shop at patreon.com backslash bones and bobbins. Yay! <laughs> Your generous support helps make the show happen and will also earn you our very eternal gratitude and entry into our private Patreon-only Facebook group, which that's is a very fun place to be. Totally fun. I was going to say, that's where all the excitement happens. It, it, it really is. <laughs> we There's a lot going on in there. We are small and mighty, and I love us. Yeah, I do, too. I do, too. Ugh, love them. Yes. Mm-hmm. In a dusty old shop on a forgotten old street, you'll find two witches with books three boxes deep. Next to rusty old needles and faded red thread, you'll come in for yarn, but leave with pigments instead. Whether poisons or patterns, we're always discreet. Where creepy and crafty and morbidity meet. Welcome to the Bones and Bobbins podcast. Hello, morbid makers. We are your slightly creepy, mildly disconcerting, somewhat sinister, delightfully discomposed, opaquely odd, merely morbid, ooh, marvelously <laughs> misanthropic, hosts. And this is Bones and Bobbins, Season 1, Episode 15. Please, step away from the talking board. I'm Haley from Red Handled Scissors and the Very Serious Crafts Podcast. And I'm Natalie from Uber Dark Designs, an official murderino maker. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got the giggles. Oh, uh, yes, we, we do have, have the giggles for reasons somewhat unclear that may or may not be related to cat barf. Um, so how are you doing? Uh, you know, I'm all right. <laughs> like I... I still haven't la- gotten my holiday line officially launched yet and finished the shop, which makes oh, me well. feel like a fail. But at the same time, I'm like, meh. Um, yeah. So and then it's NICU November for me, which means that every morning I take 10 minutes and whip up a little NICU hat for NICU babies. And at the end of the month, they get donated to a local hospital. Oh, so, fun. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, lived in the NICU for the first six weeks-ish of my life. Aww. Yeah. And so I always feel like I should probably be involved in something like this, but no, I, I never do. <laughs> I got you. I make so many of them that it's not. <laughs> I appreciate it. I feel like I was, I, I, I wore a sandwich bag as what? clothes. Literally. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, because uh, I was super early, and babies as early as me don't do body heat so well, even in incubators. Aww. Hello, Mr. Big Stuff. Cats. Cats all around. Cats all around. Um, and so they dressed me in a plastic sandwich bag to Aww. keep the heat in, because it was the 80s. Oh my goodness. Anyway, I'm sure that your cute hats would have been a vast improvement. Oh my goodness. I would have I would have made you a whole little outfit. Oh, there are pictures of me looking just disgusted oh. with everything <laughs> that's going on. Yeah. I, I was so. born with um resting bitch face <laughs> and it never went away. Apparently that is the first look I gave my mother. <laughs> My uh, my oldest, I uh, used to say that she was gonna um, she was gonna flip everybody off when she came out because mm. she did not want to come out. And when they came, you know, like they come into the hospital room to take the photos, and there she is with her hand on her face and her little middle finger sticking straight <laughs> up. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's yeah. really funny. Yeah, she was like, I no. appreciate baby related hijinks. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Um, so, the skeleton has a name. Yay! Which is very exciting. It is. 
um, she will from henceforth be known, well, I guess I do not know the skeleton's gender identity, so we'll go with they. Yes. Um, but they shall be called Great Aunt Frances, former, question mark, head librarian of the Curiosity Shop Archives. I so, there we are. I love it. I love it. Yeah. And I was going to roll the skeleton over here again, and again, I forgot. We live in crazy times. It's uh, it's uh, easy to forget things, especially yeah. with tomorrow being the big election day. Oh, gosh. I, I don't want to say anything about it because I was just listening to a few podcasts during research Mm -hmm. for this episode that were right at the beginning of COVID and talking about in July when all of this is over. (laughs) She's like, son of a bitch. No. (laughs) Yeah. So I, I, I think we can acknowledge that that is a thing that's going to happen and move along. (laughs) Yes. Yes, yes. I don't want to touch it. I don't want to poke at it. I, no, nope. I just acknowledge it hanging out in the corner and uh, keep plugging along. Indeed. Indeed. So now would probably be a good time to take a quick little break and thank all of our fantastic Curiosity Shop members over on Patreon and give a mm-hmm. totally normal, not at all creepy welcome to our newest victim, I mean member, Patrick Brannon. Welcome, Patrick. Yes, welcome, Patrick. Aren't you excited? (laughs) We are. Yes. Anyway. You're the best. All of you Patreon members. But especially Patrick this week. And we would totally go explore hidden old graveyards in the woods with you. Absolutely. That's right. Indeed. All right. (laughs) So, talking about Ouija boards this week. And that's really funny that I said it that way because that's not actually how I say it. (gasps) Oh, Ouija, right? Yeah, Yeah. I say Ouija, and that is apparently, according to, uh, I believe, the talking board historical society or something <laughs> the proper which i was amazed to find out that exists oh there are multiple yes. organizations yeah it's quite a thing so let's dive right in first i'm going to tell you about the history which is a weird and winding dramatic tale So, what is a talking board slash spirit board slash Ouija board? I don't know. And neither (laughs) does anyone else, it would seem. So, according to Hasbro, who currently own the rights to the Ouija board, this is what they have to say. Ouija, the mystifying oracle. Enter the world of the mysterious and mystifying with the Ouija board. You've got questions, and the spirit world has answers. Mm. And the uncanny Ouija board is your way to get them. What do you want to know? Ask your question with a friend using the planchette that comes with the board. But be patient and concentrate, because the spirits can't be rushed. Handle the Ouija board with respect and it won't disappoint you. Includes game board, planchette, and instructions. Ages eight and up. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. I have to laugh, because I'm, I'm picturing my children when they were eight and being like, here is a portal to the other world. Please open it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at, at least it's not like five and up. True, true, true. They can tie their shoes by eight, you know. And presumably spell enough 
yeah. to make it worthwhile. That's work true, while. right? That's another thing I didn't even think about that. Although you might want your kindergartner to do it because you know then that they're not moving the board Ooh, because right? they can't necessarily spell the thing. At eight, you're like, why does it just keep spelling fart? <laughs> That would actually be really funny. Or boobs. <laughs> like the most common word that shows up um, arranged by demographic. Mm-hmm. Uh, because yes. uh, I, I think that would be very telling. All right. So what does the Ouija board look like? The board itself hasn't changed much since it was originally designed. It's a flat board. And in the midsection of the board, the letters of the alphabet are spread across two rows. Directly under the alphabet are the numbers 1 through 9 and 0. The top left corner contains an image of the sun and the word yes. The top right corner contains an image of the moon and the word no. Centered at the very bottom of the board is the word goodbye. Hmm. Yes, that that is not concerning in any way. (laughs) Nope, really reassuring. And so with the board comes a planchette, which is French for little plank. Aww. Yes, very cute. And the shape of the planchette is vaguely triangular and looks a bit like an inverted heart shape. The planchette itself is raised off the board by three felt-tipped feet, usually. Mm -hmm. I think some versions of different kinds of planchettes have used, like, little caster wheels in the past. The pointed end of the planchette has a circular hole in it that sometimes has glass or plastic over it, making a window that displays the selected letter, number, or word. So the materials have changed slightly from the original board. Instead of wood for both the board and planchette, now it's generally cardboard and plastic. If you're talking about the actual Ouija, like trademarked Ouija board. Mm Mm-hmm. So, using the board. Generally speaking, two to four people are seated around the board with fingers lightly touching the planchette. The participants ask a question, and ideally, the planchette will move to a corresponding answer without any help from the user. And it can get a lot more complicated than that, but that's where I'm going to leave it. Because it's largely open to interpretation or personal rules or regional rules or religious rules that changes other movements and activities. So there are several precursors to the talking board, which is, talking board is what I'm going to use to describe all of these kinds of divination devices because that seems to be the most generic term. That makes sense, yeah. There's several different terms. Yeah, there, there are a lot. Um, so automatic planchette writing was probably the earliest version of this kind of communication. And the first known time that it's shown up in the historical record is during the Song Dynasty of China, which is around 1100 CE, and it was a form of necromancy. And Mm. if you only get your definitions of the occult from, say, Hollywood, you should probably know that necromancy just refers to any magic that involves communicating with the dead. It does not specifically mean raising the dead. (laughs) So just, just to be clear... And similar practices have also been reported in ancient India, Greece, Rome, and medieval Europe. Ooh, I did not know. Another pre, yeah. So another precursor is also pendulum divination. Okay. And that can be an extremely, extremely simple process. 
that can use just everyday objects around your home. Say, a ring, because that is often what's mm-hmm. used. A ring tied to a string can be your pendulum. You can also get a lot more fancy or creative and there are many beautifully crafted pendulums throughout history and currently available that are crafted from metal and crystal. And sometimes when you're using a pendulum, there will either be rules set out to where a certain movement, like either back and forth or a circular motion, will, will mean either yes or no. no. Or you might have a paper that you have written certain responses on, or a circular talking board that can either have the entire alphabet on it or some very basic answers that you can Mm. use as well. Gotcha. And so talking boards, it is somewhat unclear exactly where they started, were widely in use by spiritualist mediums by 1886. And so these boards have very specific religious roots. And so if you're not familiar, spiritualism as a religion centers on the beliefs that spirits of the dead exist and that those spirits can and want to communicate with the living, and that it's possible that those spirits have access to or can personally provide information about moral decisions or the future or just straight giving advice. Hmm. Yeah, so it. I guess in many versions of spiritualism it is thought that the dead continue to evolve oh that's cool once they've crossed over okay and that's why they may have evolved beyond human knowledge and so that's why they could have insight into the things that you're asking gotcha spiritualism was most widely practiced in the 1840s through 19 1920s, and was largely comprised of middle or upper class members, as many things are. And it was far reaching enough that seances were even held in places like the White House and were attended by Mary Todd Lincoln and President Abraham Lincoln, who were grieving the loss of their 11 year old son well in Aww. office. That's sad. And so the pop, yeah, it it's really sad. And I guess another sad fact related to that is Lincoln's hat on the night that he was shot, mm-hmm. the hat that is preserved historically, has what was black crepe around the band, oh, and that from is morning. from morning, and it was never removed. Oh. He always wow. had that band. And usually men at the time did not necessarily wear those signs of mourning for very long. Wow. And so that, oh, that Abe. just hurts my heart a little bit. Right? Yep. Yeah. I just want to hug him now. <laughs> yeah, me too. Unsurprisingly, the popularity of spiritualism and its divination tools rose and fell with times of struggle or times of great death Mm. within history. So following the U.S. Civil War, World War I, and the Great Depression were all times when there was a significant rise in both spiritualist practices and also talking board sales. I believe the Great Depression was one of the largest sales periods for the Ouija board specifically. 
Yeah. Which I thought was kind of interesting. It is, but I guess it's unsurprising. You want answers, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It it makes me it makes me feel both sad and comforted that people were able to derive some sort of solace from that. Yeah. And I really hope that that is the larger experience that people had as opposed to feeling tricked. Right. Or right. something like that. So, fun fact, which, you know, following all the death, <laughs> uh, most mediums were and still are female. Hmm. So, among mediums specifically within the spiritualist community, support for political causes such as the abolition of slavery and women's suffrage were common. Huh. And so, at a time when women weren't generally in positions of power, Within spiritualism, which was extremely widely practiced, women were sort of able to have this influence and which these is opinions. Interesting because historically, yeah. anything that would be deemed, you know, religion and spiritualism is pretty much, you know, it kind of goes hand in hand in some way. And historically, women are not allowed positions in religion. So no. it's interesting that, you know. Well, I think the, the patriarchy is weirdly the reason that that right. is the case. <laughs> Every, it's always the Because patriarchy. <laughs> women are more sensitive. Yeah. I mean, for spiritualism. So right. it was thought that women were more sensitive, more in touch with emotion, more in touch with the other side. And so now if those get beliefs. That other side to do our bidding right now, we'd be good. <laughs> uh, Shh, <laughs> working on it. <laughs> so the spiritualist church still exists today, and there were, or and there is an entire spiritualist town. I guess it's actually technically a hamlet in New York called Lilydale. Ooh, and it's just a town filled with mediums. Wow. And I haven't been there, but I would really like to go. And there's Field a trip. yeah, there's a spirit <laughs> photography book that was oh. shot there very recently. And yeah, it just it seems like a really interesting place to go. And it's entirely devoted to the spiritualist church. That's pretty cool. So the spiritualist church obviously still exists today although it's not nearly as popular as it historically has been though i would be interested to know with the rise of occult practices right now if spiritualism is also getting a boost i haven't really seen that but it may also right. just kind of be all folded up within the general occult in people's minds now? I, I'm not really sure. True. So moving on to the board that we now know as the Ouija board. Automatic writing with a pencil and planchette was already widely in use by the time the lettered board came into use. And it isn't known when exactly the alphabet board with a separate indicator was first used, but... As I said earlier, it was already popular specifically in Ohio spiritualist circles by 1886. Just Ohio. <laughs> Ohio, man. Real trendsetters. <laughs> right? <laughs> Apparently. So the W.S. Reed Toy Company of Leominster, Massachusetts, which I am positive is pronounced in a different way by people actually from Massachusetts because you guys can't just say a word. No. It has to have like three silent consonants in it. I don't know. <laughs> I say that with love as much yes, as love and my in-law family is there. <laughs> so 
So they produced an item called the Witchboard in 1886, which may have either been the cause of or a reaction to the spreading popularity of talking boards. And we really only know that it existed specifically because Reed's treasurer sent President Grover Cleveland one as a gift for his wedding when he married a much, much younger woman. Oh, God. <laughs> and Congratulations it, on your wedding. Here's a witch board. It was unclear whether this was meant to be a joke and, you know, a, a jab at how she was going to need that to talk to him soon <laughs> or or whether it was just part of the spiritualist movement of the time but we know that it happened because he responded oh, to funny. the gift with a note okay so i think that's kind of a delightful story it is I agree. Okay. So the object we know as the Ouija board is surprisingly young. Only about 130 years old. And businessman Elijah Bond decided that he wanted to sell a talking board accompanied by a planchette. He filed for that patent on May 28th of 1890. He certainly wasn't the first person to use a talking board, but he was the first person to file a patent specifically with the combination of an alphabet board with a planchette in the form that we would recognize today. I think it was ridiculously cheap. Like, for some reason, I remember reading... About the patent, and it was like a dollar fifty. <laughs> that they paid. That the sounds patent. right. <laughs> like, I I don't think I came across that in my research, but that wouldn't surprise me. And so on February tenth, eighteen ninety one, he received the patent. Which, just in case you want to look it up, is U.S. Patent Number four hundred and forty six thousand and fifty four. Wow, that seems like a large number. I was thinking it seemed like a really tiny number. <laughs> given how many things are patented. Right, I guess in terms of, like, I didn't know when they started patenting things. Yeah, I'm not really sure. So I'm like, that seems small. Like, I thought you were to stop at, like, 436. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, alas. Uh, I, many of the early ones were related to sewing machines. That's awesome. Because they were constantly battling over parts. Yeah. Yes. But since we're not talking about sewing machines, we're talking about talking boards. <laughs> the patent itself listed Elijah Bond as the inventor and Charles W. Kennard and William H. A. Maupin of Baltimore, Maryland as the assignees. Or assignees? I don't know how that word is pronounced. That's a good I'm going to go with assignees. And there's no word on whether or not at that time they knew about the previous W.S. Reed Toy Company's witch board. Ah, okay. So nobody knows. You can speculate. They're really a, similar. Can you imagine a talking board war? Can you imagine that? Oh, there was. Oh, yay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Mystery and intrigue and war. <laughs> yes, so much war. Well, legal war. So the interesting thing to me at this point is, in order to get a patent on an object, you needed to demonstrate that that object actually does what you say it does. Ah. And so, apparently, they did, which I'll come back to a little later in the story. <laughs> okay. In 
naming this board that they now have patented, they came about it by sort of exactly the route that you would expect. They were using the board, and uh, Elijah Bond was using it with Miss Peters, who is his sister-in-law, and they straight up asked the board what it wanted to be called. Oh. And it spelled out O-U-I-J-A, and further went on to explain that that meant good luck. Ominous or not, unclear, because much like modern text messages, it's really, really hard to get tone Yeah, from a Ouija board. So there's also another story that adds to this one that I can't really corroborate in multiple sources. Well, multiple trustworthy sources, but it further, the story further goes on to specify that this is ancient Egyptian for good luck. Ah, okay. I read one story. As far as I know, that is not the case. It doesn't sound right. Like, I, I mean, not that I'm fluent, obviously, in ancient Egypt, but just... It doesn't, I don't know that it sounds like it would be an Egyptian word, but I had, I read where, like, I read one article that talked about how it was made from, from combining we and ya, the Oh, French I'll get there and, too. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that was on purpose later okay. as a marketing technique. Oh, okay. So, that makes sense. Yeah, so... It was, that information did in fact come from the source, which, I mean, there's a very long and convoluted history of this board. So, like I said, now it gets a bit complicated. So we're going to take a little dance through the woods that is the rights to make the Ouija board mm. and who owned what and when. So the Ouija board was started by the Kennard Novelty Company in Baltimore. Kennard himself, who you'll remember was on that patent yes. originally, would leave the company after 14 months to found the Northwestern Toy Company in Chicago. But his ex-business partners, the other two people on that patent, would get together with Washington Bowie, who was a big Baltimore capitalist at the time, and they would continue the Kennard Novelty Company, which was eventually renamed the Ouija Novelty Company. And Kennard himself just shrugged and made the Volo board, which was basically a replica of the Ouija board. <laughs> and so lawsuits for, the, for patent infringement ensued, which ended in the Volo board being itself ended. But Kennard continued to loudly pitch a fit about having invented the board, claiming that Bond had just made improvements upon it. So he fired back that he had incorporated the company and fully controlled it, but had named the company after Kennard as a compliment to him. Hmm. And Bond also told the story of him having gone to Washington, the location, not the investor, with a woman named Helen Peters Nosworthy, who was a well-known medium at the time, who subsequently blew the mind of one of the chiefs of the patent office, ensuring that the patent was secured at all. Both of these things seem to be true. Okay. That Bond 
did incorporate the company and that this reading seems to have taken place at the patent office. I've read someplace that the medium spelled the name of the clerk. And that name she couldn't have known, and that was what sealed the deal. Gotcha. I don't know how much of that is fiction. But it's a the good demonstration. Story, anyway. Yeah, it's a good story. And the demonstration of some kind certainly happened because it would have needed to. Right. But who knows? <laughs> so. Enter Washington Bowie, who would then claim that E.C. Reich, a cabinet maker who made the first copies of the, of the board, reportedly at Kennard's request, was actually the inventor. Hmm. Yeah. And Bowie's son, who would eventually go on to manage the Chicago branch of the factory would take a 20-year-old named William Fold under his wing. And so, rising quickly within the company, Fold became the foreman at that Chicago factory and one of the original company stockholders. And so, in 1897, Washington Bowie, the father, leased the rights of manufacture of the Ouija board to William Fold and his brother Isaac, who were running the Chicago branch of this factory. And Fold would become known as the father of the Ouija board because so many were produced under his watch at this company, but he only held the rights to produce the Ouija board for three years. Oh, okay. That's not and, that long. But so many were produced during that time that his name is synonymous with the Ouija board from then on. And for the record, Fold himself also credited Reich with the board's original invention. Oh, that's I'm good. not sure why he was weighing in on that since he came in way, way, way after <laughs> the fact. But who knows? It is certainly a fact that Reich made copies of the board. Whether or not he invented it or made it at the request of Kennard is the part that's unclear. Okay. I don't know. Nobody knows. A lot of people have strong opinions. <laughs> As they do. <clears throat> yeah, so taking a deep breath after all of that drama, <laughs> let's talk about how people feel Oh. About Ouija boards and their use. So the mass-produced Ouija board started off as a parlor game. And it's unclear how seriously it was really meant to be taken at the time. I mean, it was a mass-produced game. And so, well, its origins are rooted within talking boards in spiritualism. I don't know how much it was viewed as a tool or viewed as a novelty. The companies producing it were novelty companies. Right. So but I'm not sure really it as to read though it was that. an experience. Yeah. Either way, it wasn't seen as, like, a dangerous thing or an evil thing or a doorway to hell or Yet. anything like that <laughs> until pop culture got a hold of it. Ah. 
basically Hollywood. Okay. Go The Exorcist. Yes. That is how we as a culture were introduced to the idea that that thing was evil, that Mm. that was a dangerous thing, that it wasn't just a way to perhaps reach out to spirits in the beyond, Mm -hmm. which they are not scary. They are just people you knew who had died or people who knew more than you (laughs) who were dead. And that wasn't concerning. You wanted that. Right. People wanted to reach out. You wanted to be able to be like, Grandma, I miss you and love you. Exactly. Exactly. But as with every fun, good thing, somebody's got to ruin it. And the church is usually, (laughs) the Christian church specifically, is usually the church to rain on parades like that. Yeah. And so... When pop culture introduced the idea that, holy shit, demons, (laughs) the church also were like, wait, 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 wait a minute. That's not cool. That's scary. Of course it's demons. It's got to be demons. Oh, my goodness. Which, you know, I got to raise an eyebrow at because the church... The Christian church specifically believes in ghosts Mm -hmm. and witches and the occult broadly, miracles, angels communicating with the spirit from beyond. Like none of this is news, but because it wasn't coming through the conduit of church elders... Obviously, it must be evil. Yeah. Because lay people surely could not reach out. And I will say that I personally grew up both in a long line of women who could communicate with the beyond. And also, completely not allowed to touch a Ouija board. (laughs) Those two things coexisted. And I remember how mad my mom was when, in 1998, teenage me came rocking up to the house with a glow-in-the-dark Ouija board from... Kmart, probably. (laughs) Or Myers. One of the two. I do not know. Yeah. Oh, that glow in the dark Ouija board. That was the fancy one. So many, so many memories. It was the fancy one. (laughs) It also, you really needed the lights on still. (laughs) Right? Because how often do you leave your Ouija board out to charge? (laughs) Because you gotta let any glow in the dark pigment charge with actual light to yeah and i can't remember i think the planchette glowed too oh i think you're right it was it was quite a thing and so my mom was like "Mm -mm, not in this house young lady (laughs) and i was like i do what i want because (laughs) teenager and so that board went with me to college And I don't know where it is. That's probably not a bad thing. Uh, I, well, I have a guess. I had like a steamer trunk Mm -hmm. that is in my childhood bedroom that is filled with college detritus, Mm. like rolling papers and (laughs) probably sex toys and I don't even know books. And I imagine that it lives in there, but I'm not really sure. It's also entirely possible that it lives with my high school and college ex. I'm not sure. Or maybe I got rid of it. I don't really remember because college. Yes, 
Yes. And yes. Hang see rolling papers. Yeah. Either way, I I don't I don't know where it is, but I'm fairly certain it's not mad at me. Good. Yeah. So I think it's so really she was hanging out with sex toys. Hmm, whatever, <laughs> maybe it's happy. That's what I'm saying. It's not mad. Very pleased. Yes. Although it definitely had a cigarette burn or two on it. To yeah, buy. It happened. Yeah, and wine. There is a big wine stain <laughs> on it, which also I have a set of dominoes from that time period, and several of those are mysteriously dyed pinkish. Okay. Which I think also must have been wine. wine. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't drink red wine. Hmm. Because the first week of college sort of removed that option from my <laughs> life. So I I don't really know. So I just, I think it's sort of funny that something with such religious roots and good intentions suddenly in, well, I want to say probably late 70s, early 80s, became that about right, something yeah. that was the work of the devil. Well, and that was, was that not around, was that the whole satanic panic? Yeah. D&D, everything. Oh my gosh, I remember not being allowed to go near Dungeons and Dragons, too. Oh my goodness. Which, and I think this was more of a, not a rule from my mother, but youth group. <laughs> <laughs> Because I used to be very involved, not really by my own desire, but because my mom was very involved in our local Baptist church. Oof. So, yeah, I, I was heavily involved in the Baptist church during the Satanic Panic. So you can imagine. <laughs> yeah, wow. That, oof. That's an extra level of... It is extra. Yeah. And I would also just keep in mind that I can, I can see dead people. And so can my mother, who is dragging <laughs> me to Baptist church during the satanic panic. <laughs> and, I mean, honestly, my mom still is very much involved with that church. Those things, for her, coexist about as peacefully as spiritualism and Christianity coexisted. I mean, they were separate religions, but right. it wasn't unusual to attend a seance one night and go to church the next day. Yeah. And rightfully so. I mean, there's no reason why they shouldn't be able to exist. You know, oh, I, exist I agree them. completely. Uh, but, you know, satanic panic. <laughs> And, but I really like that the people who claim not to believe that it does anything at all are also still the ones that tell you you're not allowed because the devil. <sighs> but whatever. There are some misconceptions that I would like to clear up just a little bit. The name Ouija. A lot of people believe the etymology is French for yes and German for yes. Well, that is true. I mean, yes. just looking at the letters, that is a fact. It wasn't the original meaning. The Egyptian for good luck, or the board itself just saying that Ouija meant good luck, is the original story. But fooled while he was producing en masse all of these Ouija boards was the person who popularized the yes, yes etymology. Okay. So it, both of those came from what would be considered the source. True. But that wasn't the original etymology. I, li of, I like it better though. One of the, uh, I think I have a link in the show notes for like, um, a list of, like, just ten different, like, 
versions of spirit boards that existed through time. And there was one uh, vintage one that says au revoir instead of goodbye. And I'm like, I want that one. La? It says au revoir. Like French for goodbye. Oh, oh, au revoir. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> au revoir. Au revoir. Yep. Right. Yes. Um, oh. Well, there are quite a few that have both. English and French. I think they must have been the Canadian patent. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. Because there, we didn't even get into patents outside of the U.S. Because there's a whole mess in Canada and England involving many of the original players too. Ooh. But ain't nobody got time to wade through that amount of legal documentation. So. It wouldn't be a podcast talking about Ouija boards if we didn't talk about debunking. Yep. And so I would like to go on record with an opinion of yes and. Mm -hmm. I think that what I'm about to talk about, well, I know it to be scientifically true. I also think that sometimes there's more. And so, the idiomotor effect yes. was theorized in 1882 to explain dowsing rods, pendulums, possibly also automatic writing with planchettes. And it is specifically that... Human beings, all of them, have unconscious muscular movement that they aren't aware of and aren't intending to make. And these are micro-movements that happen on their own always. Like, your brain just does it. It's wired to do it. And it's so subtle that... You don't know you're doing it. So when you say, I'm not moving the board, you're telling the truth. But you yeah. also are moving <laughs> the, the planchette. It, like, it, you just are. It, the earliest that this was scientifically proven is 1852. It got the name, the idiomotor effect, in 1882. But... It is a provable fact that when you ask aloud a question, your subconscious mind will cause micro-movements in your muscles that will move your hand to the expected outcome. Ah. And that is, that is true. That mm -hmm. is a thing. You won't know that you're doing it. But interestingly enough, there are two or sometimes four people touching the planchette. So how that all balances out is an interesting question. And I would argue that sometimes there's something more. But often it is just the idiomotor effect taking place like it's supposed to. Before we move on to your part, which I'm very excited about, <laughs> I would just like to share a couple of stories about some famous seances or people involved in seances. And I got this particular information from an article in Mental Floss. Yes. Yes. So did you know that Harry Houdini's wife would hold a seance every year on the anniversary of his death because they had agreed on a word that would come through if he got to the other side and was able to contact her? That's kind of cool. And so, yeah, so... Uh, Harry Houdini was a famous skeptic because he was a magician. Right. And 
was used to producing illusion. Right. And so when he died in 1926, he made a deal with his wife that he would contact her if that were possible. And so for 10 years, hoping to hear their secret word, she continued to hold seances on the anniversary of his death. Aw. He never came through. Oh, that's sad. But, yeah. But spiritualists have continued the tradition. And there are arguments as to whether or not it has or hasn't worked. The secret word is known. But whether or not it came from a supernatural source or not is unclear. And I'm not going to say it just in case you want to try it. All I know is that's some serious relationship goals. Yeah, I love it, right? Yeah. And as I mentioned earlier, Mary Todd Lincoln also was very, very into seances and had them in the White House. Which and is a kind so of a fun she thought. Yeah. And so she employed some famous mediums, the Fox sisters. Nice. To help her reach out to her son and then later her assassinated husband. Oof. There don't seem to be any records of whether or not she got what she was looking for. But the Fox sisters methods have largely been debunked. Oof, okay. So, and this is definitely something we should cover in another episode, how mediums and spiritualists frauds happened. Yes. Because they made some pretty interesting devices. Oh, I bet. And got really creative with their fraud. And so... I think that is very sweet and very sad, and I'm sorry that known fraudulent mediums were who she used, but also maybe they weren't fraudulent all the time. Maybe there was just an awful lot of pressure later on to perform, which I think is also true. That's very conceivable. Like, that makes sense. Because... At the very least, it has to be a hit or miss thing because there's more than one party involved. (laughs) You know, when there's two alive humans involved, there is already that factor of, you know, human error. So then you, you, you know, you add into it spirits on another side and there's no predictability in that at all. Although it is weirdly enough known, and I'm not sure who the medium would have been in this case, but because childhood mortality rates and Mm. mortality rates broadly were pretty high at the time, Mary Todd Lincoln was able to reach out to her children. Hmm. Um, And there were actually two sons. Wow. Yep. So apparently she once said, Willie lives. He comes to me every night and stands at the foot of the bed with the same sweet, adorable smile he always has had. He does not always come alone. Little Eddie is sometimes with him. Which, yeah, I'm... uh, Feeling a little choked up. Right. <clears throat> yeah. So to wrap this up with a little bit of personal experience, like I said, I had the badass 90s Parker Brothers glow-in-the-dark <laughs> Ouija board. Yes. But currently, in my witchcraft practices, I use a pendulum and a circular talking board. I 
am afraid of both of them. And they live separately, encased in some pretty <laughs> exciting things. <laughs> uh, but th- there is that. And I might, 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 might have bought a beautiful Luna Moth handmade board from maker Jessica Casso of Yiska Designs in Australia while I was elbow deep in this research. (laughs) I laugh only because I can't tell you how many I bookmarked. (laughs) Oh my gosh, me too. Well, I... It got worse. So I started bookmarking and then I was like, I just really need to start learning how to use resin and make my own. And that started a whole nother spiral. Oh, yes. I I can imagine. And why not? You need right? one more thing to do, right? Yeah, absolutely. No craft unturned, damn it. No, no. Speaking of crafting, <laughs> feel free to take it away. Woohoo! So do you want to maybe do some talking with the dead or those beyond? Do you do you maybe want to do that? Uh, but you don't has board of your own? <laughs> Let's talk about how you can, you know, make some. You know, you could just be hanging out with some friends, you know, and like, dude, yeah. I want to try this. Do you have a Ouija board? And everybody checks their purses and pockets. They're like, eh, I left mine at home. Um... So I mean, what kind uh, of friends are you hanging out with if they don't have one? Seriously. Um, and at the end of this, you will have no excuse yourself. I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> so there are indeed uh, not only some, but many uh, people that say that homemade boards actually work best because you have a special connection to it when you make it yourself. Yeah. And I can see that. I mean, I just as a maker, anything that I make myself, there's... I know the energy and the love and the care. Even if you're, like, cooking, you know how people are like, oh, I could taste the love. Like, yeah. it's just one of those things. Like, when you when you create it, I think there's a little bit of you that gets put into it. Well, I period. can confirm that. Like, when I hand roll candles for specific requests for friends. Right. There's, like, my hands touch every part of it. And there's right. something extremely personal about knowing that you're making something either for yourself or for someone else in a very hands-on way. Right, right. And the intention, the intention that mm-hmm. goes in while you're making it. So how do you go about making one? Yes, how? Well, basically any damn way you want to. Um, oh, dear. It's the use of it that's important more so than the how it's made. Mm-hmm. Um, I can attest that I personally once made one out of a yellow folder and a blue marker while at a slumber party. And you can tune into our Patreon to find out how that went. Sounds legit. Uh, yep. Uh, so, but if you want to go about making one that lasts uh, and that you maybe use as a re- like a regular tool, I got you. Um, so, materials. Uh, first and foremost, you're going to need a sturdy base. I mean, ultimately... It is a board, so you are going to be, you know, pushing the planchette over it. It's got to be kind of sturdy. Uh, anything yep. flat and smooth as well, because if it's bumpy, even if you're making it, especially if you're making it yourself, when you be careful with adhesive and things like that, because it's got to be able to glide. And if it gets stuck on something, then, you know, miscommunication occurs, you know. Um, so ideally, though, it is it is thought that it should be made of wood. And the reasoning behind that is that it retains earth energy and that serves to focus the spiritual energies and foster better communication with the supernatural. That's very better, grounding. It is. Better still would be old wood because old trees tend to hold more residual energy and wisdom. Yeah, Therefore, but don't cut down a tree. Right. Do not hack down some gorgeous old tree to make yourself a damn talking board. Please. Um, no. No. Uh, so you've got your board. Now you need, I'm going to call it a face. Uh, and there's four must haves for the face of your board. And Mm -hmm. that is the alphabet numbers, the words, yes and no. And then, uh, sometimes the word hello, but most importantly, the word goodbye. Oh my goodness. Yes. 
So you can then paint, draw, write, laser etch, whatever you want. Now I am including uh, printables in the show notes for an eight and a half by 11 old school classic Ouija board face printable from, and I shit you not, <laughs> Country Living Magazine. What? That's right. Country friggin' Living. Because it makes me laugh. Well, fuck me. <laughs> How and where, I don't know. It actually, it, the link is so old that it comes, it's actually through the Wayback Machine. <laughs> so it clearly no longer wow. exists on their site. Um, but I'm also linking to a tutorial um, by a woman named Heather Tracy. And in that tutorial, there's principles to not only create an 85 by 11 but also Altoid tin size spirit boards and planchettes. Aww. And they are utterly delightful. Her tutorial is interesting and very well done. Um, but then you can carry, you know, your little Altoid tin spirit board in your purse. So the next time you're at a party and they're like, hey, let's do, you know, let's do some talking with some spirits. You can be like, I got you. And it smells like peppermint. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Lastly, you will need a planchette. Um, And Heather's tutorials contain printables for both sides of the planchettes as well. What is a planchette? You covered that heart shaped tool, kind of like upside down heart that slides around the board to point to and answer questions. The shape allows for the pointed tip to indicate the desired response, but most uh, also contain clear plastic or glass circle in the middle so it can then rest easily over an exact item as well. In a pinch, you can use a shot glass. It's true. It works. Well, pretty much any glass. Right. Whatever you use, it just needs to glide on the board and be able to clearly point to or indicate the letter, number, response, what the spirit desires. I am also uh, linking a uh, printable from uh, for Witchboard by Raven's Blight, um, which is just a really fun design. And her planchette, she makes from gluing the image to corrugated cardboard, mm-hmm. and then she attaches three dot- dried beans to the bottom of it so that it glides, um, which I thought was pretty smart. You can actually, you can just get really, really creative with it. Um, you could use one of those... Little tiny tables that come in your pizza. Ooh, yes. Well, I guess oh, yes. you wouldn't be able to see through it. <laughs> Never mind. Well, you could use that to put your little tiny Altoid tin one on top of it. <laughs> I really need that to exist now. Of course. We Ooh, should make that happen. We, <laughs> we need them for our dolls. Oh, yes. Frozen Charlotte size. All I'm saying. All right. I agree. That's a plant. So you've got your board. You got your planchette. What you gonna do now? I don't well, know. I'm gonna talk you through it. Okay. So before you do this, obviously, I think that I can speak for both of us that there's been times that we have engaged in this activity, probably a couple of sheets to the wind, and not the kind you wear as a ghost. 457. <laughs> but underneath the influence of various things. Um, but if you have the wits about you. <laughs> that was the number of sheets. Oh, nice. <laughs> to do it uh, properly, then uh, you're going to want to gather your Ouija board and a planchette. You're going to want a friend because you should not do this alone. And you're going to want at the very least white a white candle and optional is a pentacle or a spell casting tool if that's your thing. If it's not your thing, that's cool too. But I'm going to include a little just abbreviated protection spell ex- explanation uh, when I get to that. So you're going to want to place the board on a solid surface. Now there's two schools of thought. One is just on a table or whatever. But the other one is that the uh, people that are that are actually... Uh, using the board should have it placed on their knees so that the board is resting on them as well as their fingers on the planchette. Ooh, do you know why that's so scandalous? Because knees touching and And stuff. men it was ideally a man and a woman too. Ooh. Originally. At a time when you couldn't 
touch the opposite sex if you weren't married to them because Ooh, saucy. having having the vapors. The vapors. <laughs> anyway, that's something I forgot to say in nice. mine, so I'm glad you brought it up. There we go. Uh, so whatever you choose, wherever you choose, you should at least light one candle, like one white candle. It can be a Dollar Tree one. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Yep. Remember, like everything, well, most things that we talk about, uh, intent is the important part. Yes. So white candles usually symbolize purity and are used for prayer. They can also be used for communication, but that's like a whole other episode. Bottom line, white candle. Yeah. Just a little, little extra help there. Uh, now, before you begin, then don your protection symbol. If you don't have one or don't believe in that, you can at least, while it's optional, say you can call it a spell, you can call it a prayer, whatever you want to call it, but just simply say a little something over the board, uh, as simple as asking for only those who seek to communicate to come forward, for only good spirits to come through. Uh, and once you've assembled your gang, placed the board and protected yourselves, you're ready. Which brings us to initiating contact. Like I said, uh, <laughs> same basic setup on all of them. There's the alphabet numbers, hello, goodbye, yes, no. And that's how you communicate with whomever chooses to come to you. Now, each player will like, places their index or middle finger, sometimes both, um, lightly on the planchette, like fingertip lightly. Then slowly move the planchette in clockwise circles to kind of warm up the board. This is the only time that you should intentionally move the planchette. Yep. So once you've warmed the board up, then start the session by opening a line of communication. Um, and don't go counterclockwise. Yeah, no, no, not counterclockwise. Uh, and it, you can you could totally use the cliche as there anybody there. It's fine. That's perfect. Sometimes it can take a little while, so encourage the spirit to use the combined energy of all the players to move the planchette. Um, you should try to have just one designated spokesperson. Yeah. At the very least, only one person talking at a time. Mm -hmm. Uh. Begin to ask questions. Always be respectful and give the spirits time to respond. Again, whether you believe this is an actual thing and this actually works or not, you should show respect as though it does work and you're respecting the people involved. Yes. Because don't be a jackass. I mean, it's just that simple. Uh, yes, that, that is one of the cardinal rules. Right. Right. Uh, so it's best to start, again, simple questions to begin with until you get a feel for the session. Easy yes or no's. Um, you can do how many spirits are present, how old are you, um, what's your name. Um, and you can ask, you know, when did you die? Be super respectful when asking about anything to do with somebody's death because, dude, it's death. Um, continue the session for as long as you ne as needed. Uh, but stop if anybody starts to feel, like, super uncomfortable or unwell, like, physically unwell, because that's been a possibility, too. So don't feel disappointed if you don't get a response. Uh, you must remember that uh, spirits are not there to entertain you, and you don't want to ever force anybody to speak to you. No. So, right. So gauging the energy and the mood. There are a few ways to note if Read the, spirit, the room. Right? Is unhappy with the questions being asked, if they're not in the mood to speak with you, or even if they're a bad spirit. The <laughs> planchette should move smoothly across the board. It could be fast or slow, um, but smooth. And it should feel like the planchette is, or if it feels like the planchette is being tugged forcefully from under your fingers, or the board is pulling or pushing... And I shouldn't need to say this, but if it's thrown, probably a sign that, you know what, guess what? Something's not happy. Something's not nice. Maybe, maybe not a, maybe not a good time. Uh, should you find yourself self speaking with a bad energy or angry spirit, you should stop your game immediately. Do not fuck with it. Do not piss off the dead people. They've no. got nothing to lose. It's also possible that a spirit can lie about who they are. So if they say they're great grandma doesn't necessarily mean they're that great grandma 
when it comes to who speaks with you, you really don't have a say in who it is. And they know that. They know that you can't actually tell who you are unless you are a psychic medium, of course. Um, and so I really just need to stress super fucking hard. The game is not over until you intentionally make it over. In yes. the same way that you open the portal, you gotta friggin' close it. Circle the yes. plan check. And like neon and, signs. Right, and you say goodbye. And you move that piece over to goodbye. Period. Do not ever forget to close out the board. Period. Period. If something is going wrong, don't panic and break the board. That's not a good idea. You know why? You can't close the portal if the board is broken, jackass. And if you can't close the portal, you basically open up the door to God knows what, and you have to let them run free until you get somebody to come clear this place and close it another way. Yeah, and really, I don't have time for that shit. Right. Ain't no one. At this point, if the game ended on a bad note, it's probably best to clear out the negative spirit and energy from your space and your house. Mm -hmm. Even if it doesn't end negatively, still probably a good idea. Kind of yep. wipe the sleep clean. Just make now, a heavy, like a full stop. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's best to do so immediately so that it doesn't get a chance to mess with you. And there's tons of horror movies out there. And I've heard some serious stuff. So trust me when I say it's best to just work quickly when it comes to purifying your space. Now, I am including yep. a link of the show notes on how to cleanse without using sage. If you are new to us, we are firm believers in staying in our own cultural fucking lane and it's important that we help others do the same. Sage and smudging are sacred tools of indigenous people, and it is not our ears to use. So make sure you check that link and uh, find some other ways before you start. Not like shit goes wrong. You're like, oh my God, what do I do now? Maybe take a quick look through first. So mm -hmm. you know how to make it. You know how to sim safely interact with your talking board. What do you do when you no longer want it or have had some like crazy shit happen and you're pretty much just like, hey, this maybe isn't for me. How do you know if it's time to get rid of it? How, it is, how do you? <laughs> it may be time to get rid of your Ouija board or maybe buy a new one, make a new one when you experience any or all of the following. Number uh -oh. one, the planchette just moves on its own. No one is actually touching it. Or it constantly loops in a figure eight. Yeah, Two. figure eights are a bad idea. Yes. The board says things like death, zozo, which I do not understand. You shouldn't say that out loud. Oh, oops. Okay. Don't say that out loud. I take back that word. I didn't say it. Uh, or evil. So. Uh, yeah, just, just spell that word. Don't say that word. Okay, so. If it says things like death, Voldemort, or evil, <laughs> he who shall not be named. <laughs> well, but I mean, you really. Uh, anybody Do I need to start lighting thinking, candles now? <laughs> no. Uh, well, maybe. Um, but anyone who's making one should know that if you should encounter something that selects the letters Z and O repeatedly in that order. It's time to close the board and definitely, definitely, definitely clear the energy. That is not something you want to mess with. Thank you. Yes. The next thing, now that I've learned not to say that out loud. Uh... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I'm glad I know. Is that the board itself actually admits that it's satanic in origin or spells out, like, names of specific demons or shit. Or if it... Yeah, like, that, in, that's the issue with the Z thing. Ah, gotcha. Uh, or it's, it insists that its name is a number or points to certain, I guess, power numbers are called. Like, I don't know, 666. Basically, all these, time to just GTFO. Yeah. So how do you properly get rid of your talking board? One now, is that's a very good question. Yep. One is ignore it. Ensure that the board was closed down properly during your last session, which you've covered, 
Wrap the planchette in a cloth so it can't make contact with the board again. Put the board and planchette in your ag- your attic, your basement, back of the cupboard, I don't know, trunk of your car, wherever. If the board was closed properly during the last session and it isn't disturbed, there should be no reason to worry. This is how a horror movie starts. <laughs> Some kid is going to go up to that attic. You're I like, mean, what's this? That, that is how... We know how this works. Yes. Uh, the next one is bury it. Many people believe that you should bury the board face down. Sometimes even goes so far as burying them in consecrated ground. If you decide to take this option, wrap the board or planchette in a cloth. Again, to ensure that they don't come in contact with each other during the burial. Once the board is buried, cover the area with a large amount of salt enough to completely cover the hole that you dug, leaving no gaps or holes. Theory is, is that during the next rainfall, the salt will soak into the ground and then purify the board. Make sure that the wind doesn't blow any away, the salt anyway before it rains. So it's probably best to do this before you know or it's starting to rain or there's a good storm coming. Uh, resalt any gaps that appear. Uh, burning and cutting. Yeah, no, don't do that. Don't. Uh, a, no. Nope, nope, nope. Um, also, the last then option is that you can donate it. Uh, there is a theory that once a board is given to a new owner, the connection to the previous owner is broken. Now, if you're going to donate it, I would suggest finding um, some place that actually accepts old Ouija boards to add to their collections. There's a amazing little place in the UK called the Morbatorium, which we need to go visit. Uh, Ooh. We do. I don't even know what it is, and I know I want to go. Right? Uh, and they will accept, uh, if you want to ship it to the UK, you can, I don't know of one here, because I was reading their stuff, and they're just really fun. So, um, those are your options. Those are how to make, mm -hmm. how to interact with safely, what two letters to not pronounce next to each other, and, <laughs> and how to properly get rid of it. Yeah, and you can also reach out to someone who, reputable who knows what they're doing like yes. a, a medium who is trusted yes and if there's something going terribly terribly wrong you probably want that help anyway right and asking their advice for the best way to get rid of that particular board is helpful Probably. Yeah. What? Because what? sometimes you can get rid of it in ways that you usually shouldn't, but you need the proper. Yes. When in doubt, ask. Involved. Like, mm -hmm. seriously, it doesn't hurt to ask. Yeah. Do you want to know something neat you can do to help clear the energy on your board? Absolutely. So, you know, 151. Yeah. Take a shot of that. <laughs> Spray it like you're taking a laugh take out of your mouth across the board. And then, you know, mm -hmm. the long, like, kitchen lighters? Yes. Light that shit up. And it'll burn, as long as you don't leave the flame in contact, it'll burn so fast it won't do anything to the board. But if it's in the dark, it creates a really cool blue flame. And it also... <laughs> Clears the energy of the board, in theory. Make sure your hair is tied back, watch your bangs. Yeah, and do it outside. <laughs> if you're gonna do it. Because you will light the thing on fire. Let's let's be honest. If you have gotten to the point where you were taking shots of 151 and spraying your so one, board, what? you have probably... You're taking shots out of an alcohol that intentionally has yeah. a net, a safety net. I mean, I guess you could also use Everclear. Yep. Um, yeah, Makes so sense. anyway, the, those are options, but if you want to really, those really are. symbolically clear the board, because symbolism is sort of the, one of the most important things here, because if you feel mm -hmm. that you've cleared the energy, you've cleared the energy. If you feel unsure, yes, you haven't. And so, right. anyway, I... I want to give credit where it's due. I watched 
the documentary, Yes, No Goodbye, the Ouija documentary. And I, saw that one. I don't want to throw any shade at at anyone, but the person who demonstrated this particular way of board clearing was a white woman in New Orleans who is, Mm. well, she labels herself, I'm not sure if any, if other people label her, a voodoo priestess. And so, speaking of staying in one's lane, um... The, yep, the, yep, yep, Get yeah, 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 that Karen. is, <laughs> and I do not know if she learned from people whose ancestry would have included that and is part of that community. I don't know. I don't know anything about her. True. But I'm making some assumptions based on how this went down, but it was probably the most badass way of clearing energy on a Ouija board that I've ever seen. And so <laughs> that is that is where I saw it. And it does it does do the thing. But I'm a little uncomfortable yeah. about the woman. Speaking of uncomfortable, that whole thing just reminds me of like the weekly oh. worst way to die. And I'm gonna go with me accidentally setting my entire self on fire trying Ooh, to do that. Self immolation. <laughs> that was not where I saw this going. <laughs> All right, mine <laughs> is simply opening a demon portal to hell. It will. Yep, that'll do it. Yep, that'll do so, it. So, um, so yeah, that that is a thing. <laughs> it is indeed. Hey, speaking of. Opening, opening demon portals. Do you want to be spooky internet friends? <laughs> Don't scare them. <laughs> you can find us at Bones and Bobbins on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I, I am so distracted that I can't e- even... <clears throat> anyway. And don't forget to rate and review this podcast. It pleases the internet gremlins and your Ouija board. And that's how we show up in recommendations so that other morbid souls can find us. And now I'm imagining Ouija boards out there just spelling out bones and bobbins yes. and people being like, what bones and the bobbins. hell? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Bring forth the morbid souls. <laughs> Uh, and on that note, let us leave you with some advice that you should never, yes, ever forget. Lock your doors. And don't run with scissors. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Each episode of the Bones and Bobbins podcast is written and researched by Haley Pearson Cox and Natalie Hoyce. Our music was composed by Loyalty Freak Music. You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Bones and Bobbins. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, follow us on Spotify, or check us out wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts so you won't miss a minute of our strange and creepy content.